Oh, you could just keep reading after that. You just need to keep reading. I could go there. I really want to go there right now. But I, I need to go to the... So write that down, Hebrews 8, 6, and read after that when it talks about the first covenant compared to the new covenant, okay? You read through that and you go eat that. Okay, step three. Okay, step one, if you're just joining, was pre-ceremony. Step two was covenant representative selected and the cutting of the sacrifice. Step three in the ceremony is the exchange of robes, belts, and weapons. Oh, you guys are about to get really excited. Every time I read through one of this, I want you to do the spiritual correlation the symbolic and the spirit of what each one of these represents, okay? So the first thing they exchange is robes. This is after they've cut the covenant, they walk through the blood, okay? The representatives are standing there facing each other. Picture this. Picture you standing there and facing Jesus, okay? Because this is what's real for you right now as the new covenant, what Jesus is giving to you. So between us and Jesus, the first step is robes. We put on each other's robe. This is symbolic of becoming one. All I have is yours. All you have is mine. Jesus gives us his robe of righteousness. We don't have filthy rags anymore. Come on. He's taken off our filthy rag. We got to we get to give him our filthy rags. And he gives us his robe of righteousness. What an amazing exchange, right? Okay, step, the second thing is the belt. You guys know what the belt represents, right? The belt of truth, right? The belt represented their armor and their strength. So when they handed the belt to the other person, they were saying, I give you my strength. Come on. And I take your weakness. This is actually what it represented, guys. I'm talking about tribal covenant. I'm talking about what the tribes did. This is what it represented to them. This is what God knew covenant represented when he did it with Abraham. And this is what God and Jesus knew covenant would represent to us when they established it this way. We need to study it and know the steps of a covenant so we can actually understand what God is saying to us. He gives us his belt. I give you my strength. I take your weakness. Oh, his grace is sufficient for us. Right? In my weakness, I am strong. He gives me grace. Come on. And the third thing they exchanged was weapons. Oh, and guess what this meant? This meant I will fight for you. Woo! Who feels that right now? Jesus will fight for us when he gave us the weapon, the sword of the Spirit. We have Jesus' weapon in the covenant. He will fight for us. He will not suffer us to fail. He will not. He will always be there for us. He will always, because he is in covenant. He is faithful to his word, to his covenant. That's why no matter what we're going through, we have to look to the promises of God. We have to look to the covenant and say, I know God that you love me and I am yours and you are going to fight my battles. I know, Lord, you said vengeance is mine and you will repay. So I trust you. I believe you. I have faith in you. Come on, God's not giving up on us because he's in covenant, guys. Covenant. He can't not fight for us. In the same way, we should fight for him. I fight to run this this run the run this race. I fought the good fight. I've run my race. Come on, guys. We can't give up and quit for the words of God that have been spoken over our lives. The callings and gifts of God are without repentance. They are sure. They are yes and amen. And we must fight for Jesus in us, Jesus in our life, and Jesus in other people. That's our mission. That's our job. We have to fight. We have to stand. We have to get Ephesians 6 armor on and say, after I've done everything, I stand because I know my God is on my side and I know I'm in covenant with him and he is going to back up my word. Come on, David knew it. David knew covenant before a new covenant even took place. David knew what a covenant meant. He knew my God will deliver me. He is faithful. 
He believed it so much that he only got one stone per giant. Y'all know the story. David got five stones for Goliath and his four brothers. He knew that God would make each stone kill each giant and they didn't have to he didn't have to try or struggle all he had to do was spin that thing let that stone fly and he knew God was faithful to not let his enemies overtake him come on I know I got some of y'all shouting in your living rooms and in your cars right now Woo! We're gonna fight Lord mm. but from the place of rest you guys know that I talk about that fight assured and confident in him it's time to be assured of the covenant. No more little prayers like, well, if God will, he'll heal me. Or I hope that God is hearing me and calling everybody up and their sister and their brother to pray for me because I don't really believe God's even heard my prayers. Come on. It's great to have intercession. But at, one, at what point do we believe him? And you know, believing him moves him more than the many, many prayers that we offer up to him because he talks about your lips are moving. I see your service, but your heart is far from me. Come on. We can pray, 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 but until our heart is in it, until we have faith and we trust and believe Him, I'm telling you, it's faith that moves the mountain of God. I'm telling you, it's faith that moves the hand of God. I'm telling you, it is faith. You have to show Him that you believe Him and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Come on, you guys need to share this. If you haven't shared this, I want you to share this. People need to get on here, and if you're on the replay, you need to watch the whole thing. Jesus put on his robe of righteousness. He clothed himself with humanity in exchange for the righteousness that he carries. He said, I'm going to take on your humanity and I'm going to give you my righteousness. Come on. We're not clothed in the natural man and the carnal nature anymore. Once we've cut covenant with Jesus and we've received what he did for us, we are now clothed with a new thing. We have put on the righteousness of God. Philippians 2, write this down, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. It says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming woo, <laughs> whoa it just hits you doesn't it <laughs> whoa coming in the likeness of men there it is Philippians 2 7 he came wearing our likeness he came in the likeness of men. He took upon the form of a bondservant. He carried my sin. He carried my weakness. I don't have to carry it anymore. It's not mine, you see. I've given it to him. He's carried it. And the blood of Jesus Christ has really washed me from all sin. There is no power in sin anymore over your life if you've received Jesus for those that try to own their weakness and their sin it's a lie you can be free from everything that has tried to keep you in bondage because the scripture says right here he took the form of a bond servant he took my bond for servant form he took the likeness of men on me he took my carnal nature and I don't have to walk in it anymore but I have to understand the covenant or I will not walk in that freedom I have to understand that it's gone. I have to understand that I have power over sin. I have to understand that the grace of God has literally wrapped me up and by His grace, I no longer sin because the seed of God is inside of me. I've been born of Him. Now I am a spirit being born again from the breath of life, from God Himself. I am a new creature. I'm not the one that I used to be anymore that's passed away when I entered into covenant he took my old nature you guys have got to get this people need to get this the church needs to get this the world is waiting for the manifestation to the sons of God and here we are I know I got y'all with me here we are we're gonna get it he knew okay he that knew no sin 
became sin for us. Come on. Now that's all over the Bible. I've got so many scriptures that I'll just read maybe one of them. But I'll give it to you guys so you can write them down, okay? Isaiah 64, verse 6. And if you don't get them written down, you can always watch the replay, rewind, fast forward, and get them, okay? Luke 15, verses 12 through 13, and verse 22. Galatians 3, 27. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And Revelation 7, 13 through 14. You need to get those. You need to eat those. You need to eat them and eat them and eat them until they get in your heart. I'll read one of them. Okay. Let's pick one. Which one, Lord? Okay, I'll pick this one. Let's read Galatians 3, 27. I love Galatians. Oh, I love it. It says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Come on. Woo. You've put them on. You're wearing him. Okay, go through and read those and eat those scriptures. The next point is that God gives us his strength when we take the belt. Jesus gives us his belt. We give him our belt. We say, here's my weakness. Here's the belt that hasn't been keeping me uh, together. This belt, my belt's been broken. I'm giving you my broken belt. And I'm taking your strong belt. I'm taking your strength. Okay, verse uh, Philippians verse 4, 13. It's probably the one that I love. Yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You guys know that. All things. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. Let's keep going. We're only on step three. We might end on, we might end on this step. What do y'all think? Should we end on this step and do another session next week? Because it's been almost an hour. And I don't want to rush through this because it's so good. And you guys could eat on these scriptures for a while and, um, you know, really get these first three steps and really do the exchange and walk through this in the spirit with the Lord. You know, maybe we can just do a little prayer time real quick and walk through this with the Lord. I'm trying to find this, guys. Second Corinthians, I'm all over the place. Oh, here it is. Second Corinthians 12... Doesn't feel like that long. I know. Should I do the whole session? I don't want to break it up, but it's so, there's so much to it. We can go a little bit longer. We'll just follow the flow. 2 Corinthians 12. I feel the glory. I feel the anointing, Lord. I thank you so much. Verse 9 and 10. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul said, I will rather boast in my infirmities. How many people boast in their weaknesses because they know God's grace is going to come upon their weakness and give them strength because that's his covenant. See, we have to get it. We have to get it. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's what Paul said. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. By grace, we are saved. By grace, we are kept. By grace, we are made strong. It's a covenant, guys. It is his promise. So now the third thing that we exchange is weapons. Jesus has defeated our enemies and now gives us power. When he exchanges the weapons, he fights for us. We fight for him. We have the power. Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19. It says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions 
and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Come on. When the enemy's trying to come in and bring hurt, when the enemy's trying to trample, we can invoke our rights of the covenant. We have power over it. He is not allowed to come into your territory that has been blessed by God. He will bless us. That's part of the covenant. I will bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. You will be blessed. All your descendants will be blessed. The blessing of God is on us. That's just the truth. And when the enemy's trying to come in and make it look like not a blessing, it's a lie. He is a liar. You quote your rights as the covenant. You find the scriptures. You find the word. You speak your covenant promises out because we are joint heirs with Christ. And the enemy has to run. He cannot stand the blood of Jesus Christ. He can't stand the blood covenant. He cannot stand when you speak the name of Jesus. He has to go. What do you guys think? Should we keep going? That's only step three. I've got five more steps. Let me tell you what they are. I could tell you what each one is because I would like to have some prayer time with you guys. Should I just read through them fast and give you the scriptures and you can write them down and go read the scriptures? Oh, this is so good. Step four is the walk of death. Each party walks around the animal pieces in a figure eight form, okay? And eight equals eternity, right? So they would walk around the animal pieces in a figure eight. Okay, so picture the two pieces. They're walking around each piece, going through the blood, around the half, through the blood, and then around the half. Each representative is walking around those pieces, and then they would face each other and say, do so to me as has been done to this animal if I break the covenant. Whoa. If I fail to keep this covenant, may I die even as this animal has died. This is what they would say to each other. This was a vow unto death, guys. This is tribal covenant that God based his covenant with Abraham off of. So God was saying to Abraham, basically, this would happen if I break the covenant. If I fail to keep this covenant, may I die as this animal has died. It's a serious vow. And when we enter into covenant with Jesus, it's serious. It's a vow unto death to fulfill the covenant or die trying. Jesus just said, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do we really know what our covenant God really sees when he looks at us through the blood of Jesus? We need to know. God does the walk of death in Genesis 15, 17. You guys, we read that. Basically telling Abraham, let what has been done to this animal be done to me if I do not fulfill my promises to you. This ceremony was God's reply to Abraham's question of how would he know that God would fulfill his promise? See, Abraham had a question because God told him in Genesis 12, I will do all these things for you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless your descendants and I'm going to give you land. Like this is a huge thing, right? And God had to know in Abraham's mind, he could sense him, he could sense his thoughts. And Abraham was questioning, how is God going to do this? How is God really going to do this? And how do I know he's really going to keep his promise? Right? So God gave him that answer. He gives Abraham his ultimate pledge. Whoa. The ultimate pledge of all time. And then to give us the ultimate pledge in the new covenant with Jesus. He had Jesus fulfill the walk of death in that ceremony by walking up the hill of Golgotha. He walked. He fulfilled the walk of death, guys. Because it's a part of the ceremony, the walk of death. Jesus fulfills every stage of the ceremonies. Wait till I get to the next steps. Each one of these is amazing. Jesus took his vow unto death. He said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but 
Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. See, Jesus was already in covenant with the Father. He was committed. He had pledged to the Lord to do whatever he wanted. And it pleased God that Jesus would become the sacrifice for all mankind. He took his vow unto death in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's what I was just talking about. Okay, so that's what's in my notes. <laughs> I was saying my notes before I got to my notes. Matthew 26, verse 39. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Your will be done. He completely surrendered, guys. He became the covenant sacrifice. He paid the ultimate price for all who would enter the covenant with God through him. Now it's our turn to believe this. We have to believe this. We have to trust the covenant. I was just talking about this, that Jesus made. Understanding that God will never go back on his word. We can give our lives to this covenant, guys, with God unto death. We can trust him. We're taking a vow right now to walk with him daily, to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him. This is our walk of death, picking up the cross. Lord, not my will, your will be done. What would you have me to do? Like when I started all these Awaken the Heart sessions, guys, this was not my will. This was God's will. He told me to start these sessions. Part of me taking that vow and, and keeping my end of the covenant is obeying him and what he says for me. What does he say for you to do? Keep your covenant. Keep your vow. He is faithful to walk you through it and walk with you through it. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will be there until you die and forever. We're in eternity right now. Okay, so that's step four, the walk of death. Step five, you guys want to keep going? Four o'clock. Ooh, I don't think I can do, I mean, this might take another hour, y'all. This is good stuff. Oh, oh, this is so good. <laughs> Step five. Pronouncement of blessings and curses. So this is what the tribes did next. They, the tribal parties would declare blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience to the covenant. God did this with Israel in Deuteronomy 27 through 32. He presented the Old Testament example of the covenant blessings and curses. You guys know it. We all quote Deuteronomy 27, right? I will bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. We know those scriptures. If you don't know it, go read it. That is God's covenant promises, okay? And the new covenant, Jesus became the curse for us, okay? Galatians 3.13. Therefore, he redeems us from the curse and he leaves blessings only. Now there's no curse, because Jesus became the curse. Are you guys getting this? There's no curse because Jesus took the curse for us. He took the curse for you. He took the wages of sin, that is death, for you. When you receive his covenant, you're set free from every curse. You're set free from all the power of sin. It's greater. It's a better covenant. It's a better promise. It's greater than the covenant in Deuteronomy 27. It's greater. It's above. Okay? People like to quote the old covenant and they like to quote God's law, but they forget that he said, I came to bring grace and truth through Jesus Christ and that there is a new and living way through the sacrificial lamb. We have to read the New Covenant and understand where it fulfills the Old Covenant. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled the curse. He fulfilled the blessing. He fulfilled all of that part. And now through him, we walk in blessing. Because he chose to take the curse for us, okay? Here's Jesus' promises. The promises you can expect when you covenant with Jesus Christ, you can expect forgiveness of your sin in Luke 23, 34. You can expect eternal life, John 3, 16. You can expect joy because Jesus said, be of good cheer 
I have overcome the world. So now you need to go through and read all the promises in a new light. Everything that Jesus said that was a promise, you need to go and read it throughout the Gospels. And you need to take that and eat it now from this new position at the table that you're receiving of understanding covenant. And you need to re realize those promises are actually yours and that God is faithful to watch over his word. He will cause those promises to happen for your life. When we haven't broke the covenant, when we have kept up our end of the deal, we haven't disobeyed. We are not walking in sin. We're not walking in iniquity, okay? Let's just get that right. You guys know. I'm not saying that it's okay to just do whatever you want and, and Jesus is just going to bless you. No, we cannot walk in iniquity. But anybody that has the seed of God in him shouldn't desire to sin. Like, you guys know that. Like, if you've really been filled with Jesus, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, there is no desire for sin left in you. You should have no problem. And, and if you have a weakness or a sin or, or you keep getting pulled back into the world or pulled back into a sin nature, um, you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to drink of the Holy Spirit. You need to let Jesus forgive your sin. You need to become a brand new creature. Get completely born again. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. And you won't have any problems with sin. Jesus gives us a clean heart. That's right. Okay, let's keep going. So that's step five. Pronouncement of blessings and curses. Step six in a covenant is the seal of the covenant mark. Oh, this is good. The seal of the covenant mark. So now what happens is the party sealed the covenant with a sign or a token that would be a reminder of the covenant. So blood covenants would be sealed by blood from the two parties. Drops of blood would be put in wine and then they would drink it. Are y'all hearing me right now? Blood would be mixed with wine and then each party would drink it. That sounds a little familiar. Something Jesus was talking about. You guys remember that? Did I talk about that in here? Let me see if I talked about it. Oh yes, I did. Okay, let me not skip ahead. Jewish law prohibited the drinking of blood. Therefore, they drank wine only to seal biblical covenants which symbolized blood. So, this was actually done, guys, in tribal covenant making. Think about that. God, the, the whole thing is like God humbles himself to what we understand through covenant so that we'll get it. So God sets up his covenant making through Jesus in a way that we would look at it and actually understand what he was saying, what he was giving to us, the promises, what it really means because he knew our culture and mankind understood covenant. We practiced it for thousands of years. They knew what it meant. It was the only way God could get a message to us. So he humbled himself and actually did it according to our ceremony practices. Isn't that crazy? Okay. Parties would rub something dark into the wound on their arm so that it would leave a, did I not, did I talk about that? Wait a minute. Where did I talk about? Oh, I didn't. Okay. So they would cut, they would cut on their arm as a symbolic, to leave a scar. Okay. This is probably, I'm going to lose a lot of people because they can't probably handle this part. So they would, they would rub something dark into the wound once they cut on their arm and it would leave a dark scar. And this became the seal or the reminder or the token of the covenant they had made. So every time they saw the scar on their arm, they would remember that they were in covenant with that other tribe. So there was a wound. There was a scar. There was blood. Come on. God instituted circumcision as the early covenant mark. You guys remember this. Between him and Abraham. He chose to shed Abraham's blood in circumcision and the circumcision itself sealed the covenant. Why? 
because they were always reminded of the scar that they could see. Abraham would always remember the covenant God made with him when he looked down and saw that scar. He would always be remembered, always be reminded of it. So to enter the covenant, Abraham's descendants also had to be circumcised. You guys know this, right? So what happens with Jesus? How does Jesus fulfill the mark of the covenant mark, the seal of the covenant? How does Jesus fulfill this step? So he gets the covenant marks, guys, when he went to the cross and he got the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet that are still viewable today in heaven. You can still see the marks. You can still see them because they're a sign, guys. He said, look at my hands. Put your hand in my side and believe the mark of the covenant. Jesus still bears it, guys. The covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ is alive and well. And he kept the marks as an eternal reminder of the covenant that he made with us. And I'm sure every time we look at him and kiss his hands, that we'll remember too. for us oh the scars from the nails in his wrist in his feet in his side will forever remind us that we are forgiven and we are loved Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. Write that down. Okay, I'll have one more page of notes. Can you guys hang in there? We're doing good. I'm glad I didn't break it up because I think it's good to have it all together. And people, you can watch it in pieces. You know, you can go back and watch it in pieces. Hebrews 9. I want to read this. I feel like I'm supposed to read this one. 